Amen. Thank you, praise band. Matthew chapter 5 is where we are. Matthew chapter 5. If you have a Bible, you could turn there. Matthew chapter 5. We've been going through the, the book of Matthew, and more specifically right now, the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus sits down at the beginning of Matthew chapter 5 on a mountainside and begins to speak to his disciples. And he gets through the Beatitudes, and, and he tells us to be salt and light. And then he makes a statement about uh, the law and Christ upholding the standard of the law here in Matthew chapter 5. And then he begins... Uh, a series of six corrective statements and where he uh, explains to us parts of the Old Testament, parts of God's law in the Old Testament. And, and I want to be specific here. God is, uh, Jesus is not going to change God's law. He said that. He's not here to abolish the law. He's not even uh, intensifying God's law. What he's doing is demonstrating the intensity of, of God's law or God's standard. He's showing us not just on a surface level, but a deeper level how these things apply. And so in chapter uh, 5 and, and starting in verse 21, he begins with uh, talking actually about the, the sixth commandment. So the sixth commandment. Let's read that this morning here in Matthew uh, chapter 5, starting in verse 21. He says, You have heard that it was said to our ancestors, Do not murder. And whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the courts. Whoever says, you fool, will be subject to hellfire. So if you're offering your gift on the altar and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar First go and be reconciled with your brother or sister, then come and offer, offer your gift. Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on your way with him to the court. Or your adversary will hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you'll be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. Well, uh, well, I've never killed anybody. You ever said that? Or you ever heard that? Usually in response to, hey, are you a good person? Are you a good guy? You think you're going to go to heaven when you die? People will say that, right? Well, well, I mean, I've never killed anybody, right? As if that's some kind of moral credential. Like, oh, good. Well, as long as you've never done that, you're, you're, pretty, good. you're a pretty good guy, I guess, Right? This is kind of the the thing that's happening here. Jesus is kind of using an extreme example for emphasis. Now now imagine you're one of the disciples standing before Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount. He's talked about through the Beatitudes, you know, poor in spirit, being meek, humble, these things. You know, each one of those things, if if you're like me, you read those and you go, whew, whew, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Certainly disciples felt that, wait. And then he says, now, you've heard it said, thou shalt not murder. And they all went, whew, okay, okay, I'm good. Whatever he's about to say next, I'm good. Because I know I've never done that. I mean, I've probably done a lot of things, but I'm not a murderer. So they probably took a little sigh, like, okay, that's right. That's right, Jesus, don't murder. Whew. So he uses this kind of extreme thing. Hey, this is like the worst of the worst kind of a thing. And in the Bible, it is, right? So in the Bible, when you see uh, murder brought up in the Old Testament law, The penalty for committing murder is the death penalty. It's a capital offense. The Bible is unanimously pro-life. Evangelicals are therefore almost unanimously pro-life. We're against murder. We value human life. Whether that's a human life that's maybe come to the end of their life, and so they have to be confined to a a, a retirement home or a nursing care facility. You know, Christians historically uh, have started those. Even in, in Oklahoma, you think about what the ministry of Oklahoma Baptist, we have uh, Baptist Village, which is where we take in uh, senior adults who are no longer able to take care of themselves and have to be in a facility and can't afford it. We help provide for those. We also, uh, in Oklahoma, have Baptist, some of, your, some of your tithe money, when you put it in the plate, a portion of that we send on to the state to also use for uh, 
uh, Baptist boys and girls homes for children who aren't able to take care of themselves because they're too young. Mom and dad aren't in the picture. And so we help take care of those little lives. We also have crisis pregnancy centers in Oklahoma that your, your Baptist tithes and offering go to the state office to support for lives that have not yet been born to support those, to help those, to provide for them. We are pro-human life as Christians and certainly as Southern Baptists. But, but notice it doesn't say thou shalt not or you shall not kill. Unless you have a King James Bible, King James still says kill, but every other translation says murder. And in the, 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 the word that's used there in the Greek and in the Hebrew in the book of Genesis chapter 9, it, it differentiates the two. Uh, it, it means murder, not kill. And here's what I mean. You know, the Bible uh, says it's okay for a person to kill when they are in a, a war situation, a just war. That kind of killing is not, uh, is not a sin. Also, if they're in a self-defense situation, the Bible provides for defending oneself and defending one's family. Also, the Bible talks about unintentional death. When somebody accidentally what we commits what we would call like manslaughter, kills somebody but doesn't mean to, the penalty for that is not as severe as the penalty for committing what we would call premeditated murder. And capital punishment. The Bible says that when a person commits murder, that they should be killed by the government for that. As a matter of fact, Genesis 9, 6 says, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. So murder and killing, a little bit different there, but this act of murder is the most severe crime and it has the most severe penalty. Let me just take a quick second to say this. So I, I've preached the Sermon on the Mount before and... Uh, um, it's been about six years ago I preached this Sermon on the Mount. And I just preach verse by verse. You know, y'all know how I do if you've been here. I just go in order. And so wherever it lands, it lands. And so one day I preach this passage on Mother's Day. Murder on Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, right? Fantastic. Fantastic. But this passage really isn't about uh, murder, is it? Jesus brings up this really extreme uh, sin of murder for emphasis to make another point. Well, you know, and we all would agree... If you commit murder, you're going to answer for that. It's wrong. God's judgment will be that you're guilty if you commit that crime. I mean, if you know anybody that says that, that murder is okay, get away from them, right? They are bad news. Stay away. We all universally agree that that is bad news. And if you study the Bible at all, you know that right off the bat. You know that. But Jesus takes that and makes a comparison. You know, murder's bad, right? And everybody goes, oh, yeah, that was murder. They're bad. He says, but you know what else is bad? Anger in your heart. Anger in your heart, that's also bad. Yeah, if you murder, you're going to be subject to God's judgment. And if you're angry, you have bitterness and anger in your heart, guess what? You're also going to be subject to God's judgment. And so he compares it then to the most extreme thing that we can think of. So you think, oh, murder? Oh, I'm good. Whew, I've never done that. Let me ask you this then. Have you ever been angry with somebody? Have you ever had anger and bitterness in your heart? Let it stew. Let it fester in your heart. I don't have to ask you that question. You don't have to raise your hand. Because we all have. We all have. Because we've all driven in rush hour traffic. No, I'm kidding. But truly, anger, we, we all go through times in our lives where we have anger at somebody for some perceived injustice. The Bible is very specific about this. Verse uh, 3, 14 of 1 John says, We know we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers and sisters. The one who doesn't love remains in death. And so it's this idea of loving people. If you're loving somebody, how can you hate them? If you're fulfilling this standard to love, then listen, you got to love your brother and sister, no matter what. Followers of Jesus. Now I want to tell you this on the outset. I've heard some preachers say this, and I don't think this is exactly what Jesus is saying. So I want to be really clear. I've heard preachers say, well, if you hate somebody, it's just as bad as killing them. You might as well have gone out and killed them. Not true, okay? I'll be really clear. I'm not telling you that if you hate somebody, then you might as well go kill them, okay? 
Listen, I think if I say that, I might be an accessory to your crime. And I don't want to be an accessory. I'm going to tell you, don't murder, all right? I can't go to jail, all right? I'm too pretty for that. <laughs> and so re- I want to be really clear. Don't kill people. You might as well kill them. No, no, you not might as well kill them. Now, that's a sin, just like murder, but to say, well, you might as well have killed them. Well, you had anger, and then you had the action of taking a human life. That would be a compounded crime, right? So if you had that anger in your heart, Jesus is saying, that's bad. It's not good. It's a sin. But you don't want to compound sin. You don't want to add on to your sin. So, so don't go ahead and do that. But, but I will say this, that when, you, when a person does commit murder, it starts with this emotion of anger, this feeling of anger. Murder starts with anger. Now, I'm not talking about like serial killers and psychos and all that stuff. We watch all these dramas and and, uh, different kinds of TV shows. I'm talking about when a person goes out and kills another person intentionally, it always starts with this feeling in their heart of anger. And anger seems to, to grow as long as it's harbored, and it turns into hate. And murder is the ultimate expression of hate. So whether you act on it or not, you are in your heart uh, somehow kind of guilty of that crime. And and let's be honest. If we weren't afraid of the consequences, probably a lot of us would commit murder. I mean, a lot of us have been so angry at somebody, the only thing holding us back is what would happen to us if we acted on that feeling. We're cowards of the consequences. We don't want to go to jail. We don't want to have to live with ourselves after the fact. So we restrain ourselves, which is good. But the only thing that's keeping us from committing that crime is the fear of going to jail for it. In our hearts, we're just as guilty. I mean, anger, hatred, bitterness, when it's full grown, it turns into death. Now let's mention this for a second. Anger is often an emotion. A lot of times when you feel anger for the first time, you can't really control feeling anger. Isn't that true? That person cuts you off in traffic. That feeling wells up inside of you. You didn't decide to be angry. Something happens. A person says something to you. You hear about something someone's done, and you instantly feel anger in your heart. It's it's an emotion, right? It's not unlike uh, the next corrective statement we're going to talk about, which is uh, adultery. Uh, oftentimes, if somebody looks at uh, someone attractive, they might, they can't really help that feeling they feel in their heart. Ooh, that's an attractive person. But there's a difference between seeing an attractive person and then deciding to continue dwelling and lusting after that individual. Same thing with anger, right? Like you might have a circumstance that makes you angry, but then, and you can't really control that. But listen, you can control what happens next. Isn't that true? You can control the words that come out of your mouth. Isn't that true? Some people say, oh, I couldn't help it. Yeah, you, you, but you could. But you could, right? And some people say, well, l- listen, no, they did that. It's not my fault. They did that. That's the reason I'm angry. It's their fault. Well, it might initially be their fault, but when you choose to dwell on that anger and let that anger turn into hate and bitterness in your heart, listen, friend, that's your fault. That's your fault. And only, it's only going to hate you. It's going to hurt you. Now, you might say, because some of y'all have been around church a little while, Pastor, what about righteous anger? We use this this big term uh, as Christians, righteous indignation. Anybody ever use that term? You were mad if you said that, right? Righteous indignation. And Pastor, you know, I know in the Bible it says that, that, that God gets angry, right? And Pastor, don't you know the Bible says this? Be angry and sin not. See, right there, we're allowed to be angry, Pastor. So you tune, you tune it down this morning, brother. Well, listen, the Bible says that. There's some stuff that should make us angry. There is such a thing as righteous anger. Righteous anger should be, should be our anger uh, directed at sin or things that upset God. Let me give you a, 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 a matter of fact, that, that verse is in Ephesians 4. Be angry and do not sin. See, we can be angry as long as we don't sin. But here's the problem. Have you ever tried to do that? Well, when you're angry, isn't sin like right there? When you're angry, aren't those words that you don't normally say, aren't they just like on the tip of your tongue? 
or maybe said under your breath? Or, 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 or what's next after you're angry? Are you ever just angry and that's it? Or do you ever think about vengeance? Do you ever think about maybe even self-righteousness, like, oh, look how terrible they are. I would never do that. Look how good I am. Or I hope they get what's coming to them. See, our anger, unlike God's anger, is rarely ever pure because we have a sin nature. And that sin nature takes any opportunity it can to get us to sin, including being angry. James says this, uh, understand this, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, for human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. See, anger in your life, no matter how justified you might feel that it is, does not bring about in your heart, in your life, God's purpose and plan for you. God's even anger in your heart, no matter how, how justified, doesn't make you more righteous. It's probably going to make you less righteous. Man's anger is very rarely pure. And then he brings up a couple of examples. And if you notice this, these might be confusing to you. Uh, he says that if, you know, if, you, if you've heard it said, if you commit murder, you'll be subject to judgment. I tell you that if you're angry, you'll be subject to judgment. And then he says this, he kind of gives these two examples. Whoever uh, insults his brother, now I'll tell you, some of your translations are different there, and here's why. In the, in the Greek language, it references a Aramaic word, raka. Anybody's Bible say raka right there? You've seen that? Okay. Uh, raka is an Aramaic semi-cuss word, all right? So don't add it to your vocabulary. But it essentially means uh, like empty-headed. Okay, so, so we might call somebody empty-headed. We wouldn't say that today. We'd probably call them stupid. Isn't that right? So you're insulting that individual. And he says if you, if you insult them, um, you'll be subject to the court, probably Sanhedrin court there. And whoever says you fool will be subject to hellfire. Now, is it just me or does hellfire seem like the worst thing here? So if you kill somebody, just judgment. If you, if you are angry, just judgment. If you call them Raqqa, then, then you, you know, you're just going to have to go to the court. But if you say you fool, that's the worst thing, you go to hellfire. So I don't think that's what's happening. I don't think we're seeing an intensification of uh, insults or, or intensification of action here. I think this is a play on words. So that is to say, all of these things, all of these sins that are mentioned here in this little short section, put you in danger of hellfire. All of these things put you in danger of the courts. And they put you in danger of judgment. Jesus is using a play on words. I think that's what's happening. So, so raka, one of these insults, and then you fool. Oftentimes, with anger comes insults. And that's the two, that's the two uh, examples he gives. Anger in your heart, which leads to these, these kind of insults, saying these things to people. Empty-headed, you, you idiot. That's, that's maybe what the word raka means. Insulting someone's intelligence. And then when it says you fool, we use that term a lot, right? Like, uh, I mean, that's a foolish thing to do. Or, man, that, you old fool. Or we might say something like that. But the word in the Bible for fool indicates a godless person. For example, the Bible says the fool says in his heart there is no God. That's an Old Testament passage. So, so this means a person that, that is without God. And so you're, you're not only saying that they're maybe lacking intelligence when you say they're a fool, but you're also saying they're godless. They don't have God in their life. And that's interesting, too, because that's an insult, but it's also judgmental, isn't it? It's what something Jesus is going to attack in the, the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere in his teaching through the book of Matthew, being judgmental, judging others. Now, uh, some of y'all know your Bible so well that I just I have to make these caveats. But doesn't Jesus call people fools? Like, doesn't Jesus do exactly what he says not to do? And, and doesn't God get angry? God and Jesus are telling us to do something that they do. How is that okay? How is that fair? Well, let me explain it to you. You're not God or Jesus. Good enough? Well, let me, let me go a little bit more. Let me go a little more. Let, let, me, let me ask you this question or give you a, maybe an example. If you have a little kid at your home that's cra or ever have had one that's crazy and wild and rambunctious and difficult to deal with, you might tell people that, right? Man, I got this wild, crazy heathen at my house. I don't know what to do. And you might say that. Don't think anything of it. But the first time somebody else says it about your kid, am I right? 
Like, like the first time you get called into a parent-teacher conference, <clears throat> well, apparently this teacher thinks my kid is misbehaved, don't know what's wrong with her, right? Like if it's your kid, you can say it, but let somebody else say it, and them's fighting words, right? That's a, that's a thing here, you know? Uh, God, the Father, created mankind in his image. This is why human life is so precious and why we view it that way. God creates man in his image. Every human being is an image bearer of God. He created him. Not only that, God the Father sends his son Jesus all the way to earth to die on a cross and pay for the sins of that individual. He's got a lot invested in you. And so if God says that, that a person is in his judgment without God's present and God presence in his life, only he is qualified to make that assessment. Okay? And so when, when a person, God says that a person is acting foolishly, when God gets angry, only his anger is righteous. So God can say it. But when God says it, it's not an insult. It's an accurate assessment. God is only the one who can make uh, that judgment in your life. And matter of fact, we talked about insults. You know, the Bible talks a lot about sins of the tongue. Uh, whenever we think about all the sins there are to sin, a lot of them have to do with saying something or involve saying something. The Bible is really replete with these acknowledgments. There's all kinds of sins that a person could have uh, committed with their, their tongue. If you think about lying, absolutely. Proverbs says, uh, death and life are in the power of the tongue. James chapter 3 says, the tongue is a fire. The tongue of, is a, a world of unrighteousness is placed in the tongue in our bodies. It stains the whole body, sets the whole course of a, life, a person's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. When you study what the Bible says about our speech and the kinds of sin that we're capable of by using our tongues, it make you want to talk less. It'll make you careful about the things you say, more careful anyways. So Jesus uh, kind of transitions then from anger and then even angry insults to a, an idea of, of reconciliation here. Here's what he says. He gives a scenario. He gives actually two scenarios. He says, if you're uh, offering your gift on the altar, so envision a person heading towards the temple in Jesus' days with the required sacrifice, whatever that might be, for the given offering that they're going to make. They're on their way there. You, they, they arrive there at the altar, and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Interesting. So a person is going about their religious duty as a Jewish person to put something down at the altar. They're at that altar, and they recall something. Isn't that interesting? I think oftentimes uh, we get so busy in our lives, we go through all the motions, doing all these things, and it takes sometimes just that right Sunday morning when we come to church, or maybe it's a retreat or a conference. Maybe it's just a preacher on the radio, but we finally quiet ourselves a little bit, enough to hear from God and his Holy Spirit, and he brings something to our remembrance a sin, a conflict, an issue in our life. As a matter of fact, we might be in one of those moments this morning with somebody in this room. As we think about anger in our heart, you might be thinking about somebody in your heart who you are harboring bitterness towards. We talk about reconciliation. You might think of someone who you need to be reconciled with. But this is a scenario. A person's at the temple. They're ready to put their altar down or their gift on the altar and in their mind, they remember a conflict, an issue with somebody that they, that they have. As a matter of fact, actually, that's, that's not even it. It doesn't even say if you are about to give your, altar, your gift on the altar and you remember somebody you're mad at or somebody that you have something against. It doesn't say that, does it? It says you remember that your brother has something against you. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that a little bit more difficult? Because here's what we say. Well, you know, I'm not mad at her. If she's mad at me, that's her problem. Right? Oh, I'm over it. Now, they want to they hold a grudge. I don't care. Nothing I can do about that. But it says this. Look, if you're about to do your religious duty here, and in your heart you remember somebody who's got something against you, listen, I think the Bible would say, 
that that relationship, that conflict is more important than your ritual. He says, leave it and go make it right. Let me give you a scenario uh, for us today because we don't have a temple and we don't give gifts on the altar anymore. But maybe you're on your way to church one Sunday morning. You've gotten everybody out the door, you've gotten ready, and you're on your way here. And then God brings, you start to kind of focus in on what you're about to go do. Okay, we're about to go to Sunday school. We're going to have a Sunday school lesson. We're going to sing. We're going we're to hear the sermon. Kind of start getting focused, right? If you're a believer, maybe you turn the Christian radio on. Like, does anybody else do that? Like, I definitely listen to Christian radio when I'm on the way to church. Like, I want to get my mind right. You know, I want to get ready to worship. And it's in that moment you remember a conflict. What should you do? Well, I think what you ought to do is maybe pick up your phone or make a quick detour by that person's house, but get in communication with that individual and apologize. Apologize. Make it right. Figure out the issue. Solve the problem. Solve the problem. And then head on to church. But here's what normally happens, especially if we have conflict within the church, which happens because, you know, churches are made of people. Churches without conflict are empty buildings, okay? Churches with conflict have people in them. People were humans, were sinners. Somebody in the church have a conflict with somebody else. And by the way, I'm not preaching at anybody because I don't know of any of these conflicts that are happening right now, so that's good. But it has happened in the past. Somebody get angry at somebody else. There's a conflict. And you know what they do? Both, both parties in that conflict stop coming to church because they don't want to see the other person. They don't want to pass them in the hallway. And so you, you read this verse. Well, doesn't it say, you know, don't go to church till you make it right? No, it doesn't say that. It says, go make it right and then come to church. That's what it says, right? Like, isn't it so crazy? People have conflict and then both parties leave the church? Like, we should at least get to vote on which one we like more. You know what I mean? <laughs> you got a conflict, address the conflict. Go make it right. Go make it right with that person. If they've sinned against you, forgive them. If you've sinned against them, forgive them. If it's a disagreement, I've told you before, in any disagreement, almost always you have something to apologize for. Isn't that true? Probably something. Like if they're 99% wrong and you're 1% wrong, you got 1% to apologize for. But don't say that especially in marriage. Don't say, honey, I'm 1% wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> that will not help. You got something, make it right. Fix it. Fix it. Matter of fact, Romans 12, 18, let me give you this verse this morning. I've shared this with many people in conflict. I'm going through this issue with a family member. I'm going through this issue with a friend. What do I do here? I've tried, but it's not working. How do I fix it? Romans 12, 18 is your verse. You may want to write this one down. It says this, if possible, as far as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. If possible, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Here's why. It takes two, two parties to live in peace, right? Have you done everything in your power to live at peace with that individual? Have you done everything God would want you to do to live at peace? And that person refuses to live at peace with you. Well, you've done everything you can do. So this scenario would be, hey, you know, somebody's got something against you, but you know what? I can go to church today and I can, and I can move on and I can pray and I can sing because I know I've done everything in my heart to make it right. I've done everything I can to make it right. They refuse to live at peace with me. Here's the illustration then. Uh, if it's fixed, if it's broke, fix it. You ever heard that phrase? Like if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it is broke, Fix it. It's funny how like um, at our houses, sometimes things will break. Anybody else guilty of this? And, and you just get, kind of get used to it being broken. Like that door latch that you kind of have to shimmy and shake and pull up before you push in. We just add it to our routine. We don't even think about it. Like if you've got a, a place that's messed up on the carpet, after a while, you just, you don't notice it anymore. You just pass right over it. Um, the, the first church I ever served at as a senior pastor, as a pastor at, when I got there, the building was over 100 years old, was in terrible disrepair, terrible disrepair. Here's how bad it was. 
uh, on, the, on the sanctuary, you know, they had windows on the sanctuary. The sanctuary is the outside of the building. And on the sanctuary, they had like 13 windows. And two of those windows had been broken out and covered with plywood on the sanctuary. And here's the thing. Nobody noticed it anymore, right? At first, you saw that piece of plywood. Man, I, got, I just got you. You know, that really bothered you. But then you just got used to it, right? But how does that look to an outsider coming in? Looks like you don't care. You're unmaintained. A lot of times we'll do that at our house. You ever do that? You ever think somebody's coming over and you try to look at your house like you're trying to clean up? You're like, is there anything that's going to look funny to them that I've gotten used to in my own mind? So here's a good, exa- a, a good principle for your life. If it's broke, just fix it. At the church, if something breaks, we just try to fix it. And that's also a really good principle for interpersonal conflict. If it's broken, fix it. But Pastor, I didn't break it. Fix it. Fix it. Have you done everything you can do to fix it? And do so quickly. Here's what he says. Here's the second example. He says, um, reach a settlement quickly with your adversary. He gives a scenario of a person who's, who's on their way to court because of a disagreement. Maybe a financial disagreement is kind of was what's pictured here. But these people are walking with their, their enemy on their way to court, and the judge is going to decide in this conflict who's right and who's wrong. And here's what Jesus says. says Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on your way with him to, to the court. Or your adversary will hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer, and you will be thrown into prison. Wait a second. But I'm right here. Um, but let me give you this principle here that, that you have to be alive for about two seconds to figure out on your own. In a conflict, there's two sides to every story, isn't there? In a conflict, usually both people think they are right. Jesus says, be careful, because the judge might hear your side of the story, and they might hear their side of the story, and they might take their side of the story. Settle it quickly. Don't let conflict get out of control. It's like, you know, if you wake up tomorrow morning and you see a, a boil has developed on your skin, and it's painful and ugly, and you don't like it, you know what you should do? You ought to go to the doctor and let them stick a needle in it and drain that thing so it'll heal. Now, that's not my medical advice because I don't have any medical advice. I'm just saying, generally, that's a good idea. But if you don't, and you let it sit there and grow and fester, eventually it'll solidify. And a needle no longer does the job. Now it takes a scalpel. And while a needle is very unpleasant to stick into your body, a scalpel is a lot worse, isn't it? He says, settle the matter quickly before it costs you, before it becomes a, a major issue in your life. And how quick is quickly? Well, let me refer you back to Ephesians 4. G, uh, Paul said, don't let the sun go down on your anger. You ever heard that one before? How quick is quickly? Well, before the sun goes down. That's how quick you should settle it. Or, he says, in this scenario, the judge might throw you into prison and you'll have to pay the last cent. I, I don't know what kind of conflict you might be in that puts you in danger of going to prison. I don't think I'm in any conflicts that put me in danger usually of going to prison, a physical, actual jail. But the truth is that anger and bitterness in our hearts put us in a different kind of prison. They, they, they lock us up in a different kind of way. They hurt you. You let that brew and stew and fester in your life, you'll pay the price for it. I guarantee you. Who are you angry at? Who do you have bitterness in your heart towards? You need to fix it. You need to forgive. You need to do everything you can do to fix it. You need to forgive that person. You need to do everything you can do to get the anger and bitterness out of your heart. Or else it's going to turn you into a bitter individual. I know people that hold grudges against people for such a long period of time. You hear these crazy stories. Somebody will tell me a story they're mad at somebody because they did something to them 30 years ago. 30 years ago, 20 years ago, something happened and they're still mad about it. You've been punishing yourself by holding on to that for all this time. You're not punishing them. Let it go. I know people 
who are mad at people who've already died. They've got anger and bitterness in their heart towards somebody that's dead. As difficult as it may be, you got to let it go. you got to forgive. you got to get that anger, that bitterness out of your heart. It's only hurting you. They're dead. You can't hurt them anymore. Get it out of there. Let it go. Let me zoom out for a second. So Jesus has just said, before we got to this section, verse 20, For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said that in verse 20, right before this section. He says, unless you're more righteous than the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never get into heaven. And the scribes and the Pharisees were the most righteous of the day. I mean, they were the epitome of righteousness in the eyes of the Jew because they did everything right, okay? He might as well said, you know, in, until you can dunk better than Michael Jordan or, or something like that, you know what I mean? I mean, he sets an ultimate standard here. And so you think, wow, well, I, I already fall short of that standard. And then in the, the next breath, what does Jesus do? He compares us to murderers, <laughs> all right? He says at least, it, look, look, look. If you're not better than the best, you can't get into heaven. And all of you are just like murderers. You're just as guilty as murderers. Do you see what he does there? So, so, so how can those that are guilty of murder in our hearts anyways be made more righteous than the most righteous people on earth at that time. It's impossible. It's impossible. It's impossible apart from the cross. Only by the blood of Jesus can our sins be washed away. Only because of what he did can we be made righteous. Those that maybe have committed a bunch of acts of of murder in our hearts, or even people who've committed physical murder who we might think are the worst of the worst, can be forgiven, will be forgiven. If they'll surrender, give their heart to Jesus and let him take their sin in exchange for his righteousness. Jesus paid the penalty as a perfect sacrifice. And his sacrifice is placed on your account when you put your faith in him. You turn over your sin to him. Give your life to him. Doesn't matter how <clears throat> angry, how angry or how hateful you have been. Doesn't matter even if you've committed the actual act of murder. Which by the way, if you have, please go tell the police, okay? <laughs> but even if you have, God can forgive it. Jesus died for murders. Physical murderers and murderers in our hearts. Have you received that payment for your sins? Have you been made more righteous than even the most righteous on earth because of the blood of Jesus? Have you done that? Has there been a moment in your life where you surrendered your heart and and your life to Jesus and were saved? I want to do two things this morning. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. and, And I want you to focus on two things. I want you to first answer that question that I just posed to you. Have you asked Jesus Christ to come in and be your Lord and Savior? Has there been a moment of time when you surrendered your life to him? I want to tell you, you're not here on accident this morning. God's got a purpose in you being here. He arranged all the circumstances to get you to this place at this time to hear from his word. It's intentional. So if you've not surrendered your life to him, I want to invite you today, right now, right where you're at, in prayer, just between you and God, would you speak to him? Ask him to come into your heart and forgive your sins once and for all. Confess you've been angry. You've done things you shouldn't have done in your life. We all have, but Jesus came and paid for all of it already to forgive you. Would you let him forgive you this morning? Just pray to him. Secondly, this morning, if you answer that question, yes. No, I've been saved, Pastor. I know that moment. I know that time. 
Yeah, I, I remember that, the, 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 the instance, and I remember when I was baptized, and God's made the change in my life ever since. If you can answer yes to that, uh, great. But we're not done yet. Let me ask you this morning another question, and I want you to, to answer it in your heart just as if you were answering it to God. Is there somebody in your life who you are harboring anger, bitterness, resentment towards? Is there somebody? No matter how justified you might feel in that, let me ask you, is, is there somebody in your life right now, or maybe in your past, in your history? If so, and to be honest with you, probably most of us could, could answer yes to this. So if you're coming up with a big uh, goose egg on this, you're probably not thinking hard enough. There's probably somebody in your life you're regarding anger and bitterness towards I want to challenge you this morning. Would you pray to God this morning and ask him for his help in releasing that person, releasing that anger, releasing that bitterness? I'm not going to ask you just to, just to pray and say, God, I, I let him go. I really, I forgive him. Listen, it, it's usually bigger than that, okay? It's usually harder than that. I want you to pray this morning and ask God to do a work in your heart to begin the process of you forgiving, releasing, letting go of that anger. Would you take a moment to pray this morning as the music plays? We're going to play just, just softly for a moment. Would you take a time to pray about those two things?